It's probably true experience of all of us in the last six months or 12 months that the whole uh, of the world just seems to be turning around on itself. And as far as the regions that we have been looking at for many, many years, even within those, there has been a tremendous turbulence of events. So that it all seems to have uh, almost gone into jelly, so to speak, in the last six months or 12 months, very hard to say just where it will go from here. So there's no use us making up sort of patterns of ideas that it's going to go this way, in fact, if we really don't know where it's going to go or rather how it's going to go to the place that we do know. I think the important thing is in these uh, prophecy days that we have a clear concept when we leave of where it will go. How it gets there is another issue and always was and has been already stated today there's a number of times when we've been quite surprised to see the way that things have actually come out and other times we've just simply had to wait and another phase took over and then we could see how it was going. Our title tonight is uh, of two things because originally it was going to be in two parts, but we're going to join them together. And when you think of uh, all those names together, you think, well, however will we we get there? We'll be here till midnight. Isis, Iran, Iraq, Israel, and the Bible's answer. We won't be here till midnight. But uh, nevertheless, there is a, a huge area of questions that are in our minds concerning these matters, and we hope to make some good use of the... uh, of the, of the opportunity. Here's the, the general area that we're looking at in this uh, third section. The principal players, Turkey and Syria, in Iraq, in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Shiva and Eden down in this lower section here. Then there's, of course, Egypt, and Libya is part of Sudan, or Sudan is part of old Libya. And then tiny little piece of purple up there, there is <coughs> Israel. They are the principal countries, and they've all got substantial population, but it does vary considerably. Iran has a population of something like 70 million, Iraq something like uh, 27 million, and it varies from then in the different uh, countries. The religious affiliation is essentially right through that area, Muhammad, as we well and truly know. The Sunni-Shiite controversy has been a big thing in our papers. I suppose it's true that 10 years ago, very few people could have answered the question, what's the difference between Sunnis and Shiites, or what's it all about? But today we all know something about that, don't we? It's because it's become so remarkably significant to us. Muhammad came on the scene in 612 AD. And uh, he wasn't overly effective in uh, generating a large following within his own life. He was gone in 20 years, so by 632 he was off the scene, but he had indeed established a movement. When he died, a man called Abu Bekr took over from Muhammad and it was Abu Bekr who vastly extended the Mohammedan influence. In the next 10 years, and it's almost hard to believe, in the next 10 years, through the leadership of Abu Bekr, the Mohammedan faith was spread from Pakistan right over here on the east, right along the North African border to Algeria. It was an incredible success. He was a genuine head of the Mohammedan movement. The issue then arose in the next uh, three or four leaders, the third and the fourth after that, as to how they were going to appoint the next head. No one disputed Mohammed. No one disputed Abu Bakr. But who was going to be the next and on what grounds would he be appointed? The Sunnis were the people who said it's got to be someone that has a 
a continuing lineage from Muhammad. It's got to be of his blood, in his line. And the Shiites said, no, it doesn't have to be. So the one says it's got to be from Muhammad's bloodlines and the other says it doesn't. My dear brethren and sisters, history's got a laughing moment sometimes, hasn't it? 1,300 years that's been debated with blood, never stopping because of that foolish controversy. The truth was, who knew what it should be? But for 1,300 years that divided the Mohammedan community. And today, as we know, feelings on that issue are as strong as they has, have ever been in history. In all those varying countries, those Mohammedan countries, there are different percentages that are Sunni and, and others that are Shiite. They all have something of both. But the only two that are truly Shiite by majority are the Iranians and the Iraqis. Now, one of the things we want to try and uh, really get through tonight is what about this ISIS? It has been on everybody's minds. What's it all about? Well, it came suddenly before the world, didn't it? Sudden arrival of ISIS was uh, a phenomenon that uh, you saw this vague big spread uh, across the the, the map in the paper, and you think wherever that will come from, within a week, certainly within two weeks, a half of Iraq had been more or less crossed over by ISIS. But that's not where it arose. It arose actually, firstly, in Syria. Now, you will remember President Assad. He's still president of Syria. Syria is a very uh, equivocal kind of country, They've all, always had a good relationship with America and with the West, and yet they still are bitter enemies of Israel. That's the kind of foreign policy that they have, have developed over those years. Well, President Assad went into a, a state of civil war. There were people that were fed up with his uh, independence, with his... Um, using of his presidency for he and his family's uh, own pleasure. And so there was many people that were developing an anti-acid um, point of view in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. And they fell into various groups, rebel groups, some driven by the indulgence of the president, others very religiously motivated, and they said, we want Syria to be... Uh, you know, the, the top of the Islamic community. We want it to be absolutely and utterly devoted to uh, Shia, to uh, Sharia law, to all of the laws they had against the women and so on. And uh, women not to be educated, not to be seen in public, and all of the things which they stand for. And uh, others, of course, were not happy with that. And they wanted to see a lessening of the Islamic law in Syria. The consequence of that is that the country was split very seriously. And various groups, even the different rebel groups against the government, seemed never to be able to combine together. Well, arising out of all that turbulence came ISIS. ISIS stands for IS in Syria. IS in Syria. If you see Isil, it's IS in the Levant. But we'll stick to Isis for tonight. Isis then was a very radical group that developed in Syria in the midst of this civil war involving President Assad. And they threw up a leader. And interestingly enough, his name is Abu Bakr. Now, you will hear the overtone of that, can't you, immediately. That second leader was called Abu Bakr. This now, in recent times, is a man who's using his name as an indication of where he wants to go. He knows the history like we've learnt the history. And he set the Abu Bakr, the one who took over from, from Muhammad, he set him as the hallmark. As a matter of fact, he was called 
He's called Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And the Baghdadi bit means Baghdad. He's of of Baghdad, but he's not really of Baghdad. What he's saying is that the caliphate of years gone by was centred in that area. So his name tells you exactly what he intends to achieve. He wants to erect the caliphate, the Mohammedan caliphate, and he wants to do that around Baghdad, and that's, that's the place because that's where all the great mosques of Mohammedism are found, in the area around Baghdad, and that's where the caliphate was. So his name is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. It'd be amazing if we remember that and go home with that, wouldn't it? Perhaps we won't forget some of it. Well, he was a very good organiser, but he was a fanatic. He developed a political identity in Syria, deadly opposed to Assad, and he was opposed to all the other rebel groups. He stood alone. So much so that the other rebel groups would in no way deal with him. One of the rebel groups was Al-Qaeda of uh, Afghanistan fame. Very strong group. But they too, throughout ISIS, and would have nothing to do with ISIS in their Al-Qaeda group in Syria. So much of a radical was he. And he set up his uh, headquarters in a place called Al-Raqqa, which is in Syria. Now his pronouncement of the caliphate came on July the 1st last year. Caliph means head. A caliphate means a headship, a headship in government. So he was establishing himself, self-appointed, as a religious head of state. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, or as he also wished to be called, Caliph Ibrahim. Supreme Muslim leader over the conquered territory which they had taken in Syria and also in Iraq, just July last year. And he promoted his cause through terrible fear. We all know about the things we've seen in photos in the paper and so on. Terrible things, beheadings of men, crucifixions of others, opponents just shot dead in the in, on the so- soils of their, uh, of their coast. It was a holy war as far as he was concerned and he'd love to have photos all across the, the Western world on the television and the papers showing what a bloodthirsty people they were and look out if we come to you. That was his policy. That's how he thought. What about uh, the country of Iraq now? Let's fill in a little bit on Iraq. Iraq is a really interesting place. There's three major areas in Iraq. On the north and the west, at the top there, is the area of Kurdistan. Called that because that's where the Kurds have their their territory. There's Kurds in the bottom of Turkey there, there's Kurds in the top, top bit of Syria, there's Kurds in Iran, and there's Kurds in that top section there, of Iraq and they had a kind of a a measure of independence from the government of Iraq which was centred in Baghdad of course and they had worked this out over many years and so Kurdistan really ran itself somewhat although it was part of Iraq. In the lower section of Iraq, the lower third of Iraq, we have uh, a very uh, Shiite concentration. It's that section that gives Iraq its very high percentage of Shiites, Shiite population. And the other larger area is on the west. And that's where Issus sort of flowed into that area because that north-western section is mainly Sunni. And so was Issus based on a Sunni basis. So when they came spreading into Iraq, those who were soldiers for Iraq dropped their their uniforms, just left their boots in the street and fled. They were not going to fight against the Issus because in a sense they really agreed with them because they were Sunnis after all said and done. 
And so that's why ISIS just flowed through Iraq. There was nothing really to stop it doing that. So those three sections have been locked in dispute and ISIS, of course, has benefited from the disunity of those, that situation. But it certainly sent a trembling throughout Iraq because ISIS came within 50 k's of the gates of Baghdad and the government itself realised they had a great crisis and they couldn't ever seem to get an army together that would really put some resistance to ISIS, let alone anyone else. Well, there uh, turned up then pockets of ISIS around the world. Even in uh, Western countries, people were <laughs> saying, you know, I'm for ISIS in some of the mosques in Australia and some of the mosques in England and some of the mosques in France and other different places, let alone the Arab countries, there were signs, a sprinkling of interest in ISIS. Could ISIS run the world? Could ISIS really run the Middle East? What's the limits of ISIS? ISIS can't do any of those things. If you're going to be a great power, my dear brothers and sisters, you really have to have some basics, don't you? And the first basic is that you've got to have a government. ISIS hasn't got a government. They don't have a parliament. They haven't got a government. It's really run on very free lines. It hasn't got a capital. It hasn't got an administration. It has no planned economy. It doesn't make anything. It has no engineering quality, no uh, manufacturing ability whatsoever. And it has no king, no military training also. Now you might say, well, they, they have got a king, they have got a caliphate. I want you to turn to an interesting passage. Revelation chapter 9. I'm saying without explanation that Revelation 9 is about the arising of the Mohammedan power in the world. And there's not much doubt about it because everybody, Christadelphian or otherwise, that ever looked at the matter has agreed this is the case. Why was it that Muhammad and Abu Bakr, why was it so successful then? Well, the key really is in verse 11. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Interestingly, they're described as locusts in this same chapter, aren't they? Like a, uh, a great spreading wave of locusts in verse 7. There's a little proverb actually that says, the locusts that have no king. Well, what we've got today really is locusts that have no king. But in this time, the seventh century, when God let that king rise and find leadership among the Mohammedan people, they had a king, and that's the difference. They didn't make it up themselves. God gave them a king. And until that time, they had been really nomads in the wilderness. They were nobodies in this world. They hadn't made anything either. And it was partly because of the depression of his own people that Muhammad did what he did. But God gave them a leader. And as so often has happened in history, give a nation a leader, and it's absolutely amazing what they can do in those circumstances. They can be an entirely different people. So Revelation 9 verse 11 is really an interesting verse for us in this chapter that has to do with Mohammedism. Iraq is a country of, of two rivers. On the left-hand side, and the more western side, you've got the river Euphrates, the great river as the Bible describes it. It's pretty close to another river which runs more on the eastern side, and that's the river Tigris. It's the area between those two rivers that is really Iraq. It's a land of rivers and it's between the rivers that the land is rich and good. It's a very rich piece of ground. We call it 
Mesopotamia, don't we? Because Mesopotamia means between the rivers. And you know, that, that flat that goes between those two rivers, for the most part, is exceedingly fertile. Jesus spoke in the parable about putting one seed in and it might have 30, 60, 90, 100 fold. But I've read concerning Iraq that its flats are so prosperous that sometimes they get 400 fold, even 600 fold from, as an increase. So it's an interesting place and it has tremendous potential to grow things. Outside those rivers, it's essentially barren. Inside those rivers, it's remarkably prosperous. The rivers are the country. What's the historic significance of Iraq? Where's the first reference to something in Iraq? Well, the first man that ever lived, lived in Iraq. Adam and Eve were in Iraq. And they were close to those two rivers. Rather amazing, isn't it? The whole story of mankind and his habitation on the earth began in what we today call Iraq. Another wonderful person who came from Iraq was Abraham. He was very close by, wasn't he, to the, the river Euphrates in the town of Ur which is just by Babylon Abraham arose from the area of Iraq what an amazing interesting thought that is that was the home place of dear Abraham the father of the Jewish people and of the Arab people thirdly Babylon was in Iraq the most signal enemy of Israel in all of the Old Testament. Fourthly, the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, was on the river Tigris in Iraq. Nothing unimportant about Iraq, is there? A huge amount of origins are found in that very place. And as we've said before, the headquarters of the Islamic Caliphate was in Iraq, essentially around Baghdad. How did that happen? Well, it happened this way, or what happened from there was this, that after World War I, Turkey, that had lost so many of its colonies, then was trying to get back on its feet after World War I, which went from 1914 to 1918, and found it very difficult. Because in the end, they found they'd backed the wrong horse. But in all the turmoil that occurred, a man called Ataturk was thrown up as their leader. He was someone they all respected. He was the man of Gallipoli, in fact, who beat the Australians and others who were there in Gallipoli. So, fraught with inability to know how to go ahead, they went to Ataturk and they said to him, their cherished military leader, they said to him, we want you to be president of our country, to lead our country. And Ataturk said to them, I will. But I'll only do it if you give me full reign with no religious influence in the government. It will be a secular country. 1924. Now, my dear says that was a huge thing, wasn't it? He was a centre that was the, the very hub of the Mohammedan faith. And Ataturk is saying, I'll rule in Turkey, but it will be essentially a uh, secular state. It will not be re religiously controlled. So they accepted that. Ataturk ruled and he was very effective. And his constitution that was formed in 1924 has really dominated Turkey to this present day, except that Mr Erdogan would really like to change it. He's much more Islamic-minded than they were back in those days. 
So in a sense, this helter-skelter behaviour of the Arab nations in recent years, this random year of, of, of no real policy or direction is related to that event. They had no caliph. They had no caliphate. It was left virtually leaderless. So that's why some years ago, around about 20 years ago now, we, you'll be able to remember that there was a long war between Iran and Iraq. And at the time I used to think to myself, why do you want to have a go at each other? You're both uh, Mohammedans, you're living there alongside each other. What, what's it all about? Well, what it was about is that Saddam Hussein, he wanted, he wanted as the leader of Iraq at that day, he wanted to be the leader of the Muslim world. And the leader of Iraq, he wanted to be the leader of the Muslim world. He Shiite and Saddam, Saddam, Saddam Hussein, he being a Sunni. So that was the meaning of those eight years of war. And it was so bitter and went on for so long that eventually they had boys of eight years and ten years going out with rifles to have a shot at each other. It was absolutely pathetic. And the world looked at it and said, whatever are you doing there? That was the meaning of that. It was just another round of this business and because they never had a leader. God did not give them a leader like he had before. Now let us come back to Revelation chapter 9. I'll just a couple of rather interesting photos. That's the upper reaches of the Euphrates. In the top area there of Turkey, of north... Uh, Eastern Turkey, the mountains get up to 9,000 feet, 3,000 metres and it's a, it's a place of great uh, rainfall and snowfall and there's many uh, dams that are put along the river and then of course uh, hydropower is uh, wrecked off from them. It's quite a, a valuable piece of uh, country. Thanks. And when you get right down the bottom of the river, this is just before it goes into the Persian Gulf, you have the Shat al-Arab and it places its miles wide as the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, have combined together and that's what it looks like when it goes into the Persian Gulf just shortly after that. Now, coming back to Revelation chapter 9, I might just say that every commentator of antiquity, of antiquity as in more recent times, always gets Revelation 9 right. Isn't that interesting? You can look up just about anyone you like and they got it right. Why was that the case? Because when you look at the details of Revelation 9, it's just unique. There's nothing else in the book of Revelation or anywhere else, anything like it. So when it turned up in AD 612, 632 in Mohammedan's time and it was starting to develop and people could see what it really was, they looked at that and they looked at this and they said, well, that's got to be the answer. And they all got it right. So clear was the description in Revelation chapter 9 that this was the uprising of the Mohammedan power. So we read in this story, Revelation 9 verse 13, the six angels sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God saying to the six angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now that's the phrase we want. Here's a statement that the river Euphrates which is like a symbol of all that area, that's going to go over its banks and spread abroad. That's the sense of Revelation 9 verse 14. And it fitted the history when the history came, when this history caught up with it, it fitted perfectly. What from Pakistan to Algeria all in 10 years, that's sure a flooding of the area that once was bound by the river Euphrates. Did you know almost every commentator, Christadelphian or otherwise, gets that perfectly clear. And if you come to another passage in the 16th chapter, Revelation 16 and verse 12. It's up there on the, on the sheet. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up 
that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now we all know that Revelation 16 is close to Armageddon because just underneath that it says about Armageddon, doesn't it? So it's latter day. What it's saying is that in the latter days the river that went beyond its borders and spread so vastly would retreat and the great river Euphrates would go back to its original borders, dried up. Now, our dear brothers and sisters, that's got a tremendous amount to do with how we understand the present situation. There was a time when God said, here's your king and away you go. And it worked. But in Revelation 16, he's not saying that, he's saying the opposite. So what we can be absolutely sure of is that Isis or no other Arab country is going to run the Middle East like they did before. And it's not really hard to guess that that would be true. What's Isis got to offer the world? What uh, Arab country has any time for Isis? They would all destroy Isis tomorrow if they could. They have no time for it whatsoever. But we need to imagine that Isis is going to pull the Arabs together and make them one again. That's the opposite that God says in Revelation chapter 16. I think that's very important. I think it's really, really helpful for us in discerning the times in which we are living. We can go home tonight assured that as much as Islam might cut off heads and crucify other individuals, they're not going to make a big scene in the Middle East for very much longer. Well, what is the answer then to this region? Well, we're going back to Ezekiel chapter 38. The page will be almost worn out on Ezekiel 38 today. I've summarised the main points in our next slide so we can get to this matter fairly quickly. What are the issues of this chapter? We, we know the chapter, we've read it today and many other times indeed. It's a great confederacy from the north. Verses 1 to 7 tell us of the various uh, countries that are involved in that confederacy. Verse 15 says to us specifically that it comes from the uttermost parts of the north. It's not about a group of Arab or Mohammedan countries in the Middle East taking the, the, the reins of government. It is not about that. It's about a power that comes from the north. We always know that. It hasn't changed. It, it happens, this invasion of this great confederacy, at a particular time in Israel's history when they think it's peace. I think we take that out of the equation sometimes, don't you? We don't really face up to what that's saying sometimes. We should. The Apostle Paul faced up to that in First Corinthians in First Thessalonians chapter five, he said, When they shall say peace and safety, that's a quotation, surely, from Ezekiel thirty eight. So that before the invasion occurs, there's a false peace in that land. Now that's extremely important to us. Because for years that peace around Israel, with all kinds of interruptions indeed, but nevertheless that peace has gradually taken off one country after another and in this very environment they're living in, it's doing it again. How interesting that is. When my people of Israel dwelleth safely, verse 8. Verse 3 describes the thought of the invader as an evil thought. This is an open statement, you know, like uh, Hitler got up and said, we uh, are at war with this, we are at war with England or we are at war with uh, Russia. It's nothing like that. This is an evil thought. It's in his mind, but he's not telling everybody broadly that's what his point of view is. Israel is caught off foot and that probably agrees with what we can see of Israel today. Just completing the five points first. It says the invasion is as a cloud to cover the land. It's just vast. There's been nothing else ever like it. It waited for the last chapters of Ezekiel, for the very almost last chapter of the, of the story of Ezekiel, 
to tell us that it was like a cloud to cover the land. Much as to say there's never ever been anything like this and there hasn't, has there? You know, my dear brothers and sisters, just how powerful is this, how great is this, uh, this matter? You know, when Russia put its foot, its paw, on the top of uh, Georgia and took off a little bit of South Ossetia, the world went mad. What is Russia doing? What do they think they are, busting over the borders? They've all been established. What are they doing? They couldn't have cared less. They just took it as so it was an afternoon snack. And then they went down to Abkhazia and they took another bit down there. and just went back home much as to say, what are you going to do about that? And the world after a while went on playing its tennis and cricket and thought, well, we can't do anything about it. That's what happened then later also in Ukraine, wasn't it? You could scream as loud as you like. But they very quickly took the peninsula of Crimea and then ran up the eastern coast of uh, Ukraine and took what they liked. And what's happened? Absolutely the same thing. But that's a small game, isn't it? What about a power that leaves its northern base as a vast cloud and comes pouring down into the centre of the world to take possession of all those countries? That's huge, isn't it? It's absolutely monumental. This confederacy is prepared to do that. Now, I've often wondered how ever it could be that a leader could arise who would have the gumption to do that. That's, that's an enormous step. The whole world, you think, is going to scream. But it doesn't. Why not? Because they too have been lulled into a false sense of security. This man is no fool. This man can play a number of games at the same time. So he's always got a set of drafts up for all these different countries. He just plays a few shots every now and again. Then goes back and smiles at them. They have another little conference about something or other. And, you know, along comes another Olympic Games or something. And, oh, we're all good friends again. He's a very clever man. And to be able to play at so many games at the same time is really quite a new phenomenon in our life. We've never seen anything like that. Just recently I, I read about Hitler and how he sort of got going. And I, I just couldn't help but be impressed with the, the comparison. That's exactly what Hitler did. He put the world asleep. There was silly old Winston Churchill, they thought, getting up in the House of Commons and saying that they should prepare for war. Why? George VIII, he was running out through the streets of Berlin waving to the crowds in, in Berlin. And Winston Churchill, in his brilliance, was alone. You can put the nations to sleep, can't you? And he achieved it. And then when, of course, the British Prime Minister came home waving the, the peace agreement. It wasn't a peace agreement at all. It was a sellout. But the British people didn't know until later, a few months, that it was just a sellout. That's what's going to happen again. This man is very clever. This man knows also that in historical terms, Russia has been great when it's been married to its religion. Its religion is orthodox. It sees itself as the, as the head of the orthodox church, even though the physical capital used to be in Constantinople, which to this moment is not yet in their control. But he understands from history that Russia's greatest times were when the Tsar and the Archbishop when the patriarch, when they are working together. And he also looks across at Western Europe and he says, we can save the world. Look at Western Europe. Look at America. Look at the next thing they're going to say is the right way to live. What? Two of the same gender marrying. Not Russia. We're Christian people. We believe in the old morals. And so many people through all those regions, are saying to themselves, Russia has got something to offer while the West decays in its immorality. He's a clever man. And that's all in that evil thought. He hasn't got any respect, really, for why Israel is there. But he's prepared to come down in the presence of the religious authorities. I don't know if you saw in... Uh, the Bible magazine recently, 
there was a, a very remarkable two pictures. One had Putin sort of about an inch away from the Pope and having a jolly good little chin wag together. And the other one saw him with the Archbishop of the Orthodox Church and they were pals. You could just see it all through the two pictures. It was brilliantly put together by Brother Paul. And in the middle there was a little quotation from Dr. Thomas. Now how did he work this out? We're a privileged people, we really are. The little quotation said that the autocrat of the Russians will see at the right time the value of cooperating with his religious authorities of the East in the Orthodox and of the West in the papacy. And that's exactly what he's doing. We've all seen it in our papers, haven't we? It's certainly been in, in much of our, our, our uh, information that's been handed around, how that he's developed that. That's a very clever man and a man with amazing ability. And if you felt that you could never understand how a leader would, would really have the daredevil tactics to go plundering down through the middle of the world, think again. You've got a man, I'm sure, who's quite prepared to do that. We're in very solemn times, my dear brothers and sisters, aren't we? Very solemn times. People don't want to face that. They just want to get on and have a good life and make some money and do all the things that they want to do. But we are in a situation today in our Christadelphian brotherhood in which we have that very precious heritage. We know where it's going. We are doubly responsible, therefore, for what we do with our time. The most significant countries in that Middle Eastern circumstance are Iran, Iraq, Syria and Israel. Do you know that Russia has good relationships with all of them? How did she do that? Cunning man. A man of immense ability. When there was trouble with Syria and all the world thought Syria was a bad boy, they all had meetings together and Russia was involved in it. Yes, and they made some arrangements. And as soon as that was done, Russia went down to Syria and made special arrangements. That's how. He does it every time. He's in with the rest of the boys and then later on he makes a special arrangement so that he could be on the best of terms with Iran. Oh, of course he is. He provided them the nuclear te technology. It's got Russian brands across it. They went down and showed them how to do it. It's all over the area of Iran. The nuclear interest is not in just one place or two or even five or ten. There's many places through Iran where the nuclear in industry has been developed. Who gave them the understanding? Russia. What about Iraq? Iraq was looking recently, but this is crowding on them, was looking to the Russians to help them. It didn't have anything to do with Russia for years. But the saddest of all is Israel. Israel has fallen away from its great western bulwark in the US. And the UK doesn't do much, really, does it? It just isn't in the same league quite. Whether it might be a more responsibility, who would know? But Israel also partly believes in Russia. We have a, uh, a meeting once a year with uh, an Israeli representative. And for quite several years and recent times, it was the ambassador to Australia that came and spoke to the Christadelphians. And one of the pet questions, as you might, might guess, is that uh, we would ask him, what does Israel think about Russia? And do you know what he said? Don't worry about Russia. We can deal with Russia. Fool's head. That's what Israel's problem is, isn't it? They think they can do without their God. They think they are a very smart people, and they are. But without their God, they will fall at the feet of a cruel, a cruel master. 
And that fits Ezekiel 38 perfectly, doesn't it? And when you look around the coastline of Israel today, it's the same story we've been watching since the day when in the hills above Washington, Mr. Bragan made an agreement with Mr. Sadat. And they made the Camp David Agreement. And the world was stunned to think it ever happened. But it had only just happened, that was Egypt and Israel, it had only just happened when in slept Jordan also, wanting to get in the same package. But today, Saudi Arabia would like to be in the same package. You can hardly believe that, can you? And tomorrow, it'll be Sheba and Dedan on the coast and the Arab states along the Persian Gulf. They also want to get in on it. They're all wanting to work together in some way. What's the common concern? Iraq. Sorry, Iran. ISIS and Iran. ISIS is driving the Arab peoples to sort of fit into their groups Scared to death that they'll lose their neck or lose their whole city. So ISIS has got to play, it's playing its role. But at the same time, in the most remarkable way, around the borders of Israel, you now have a number of countries that are working with Israel in very unique harmony. That is surely interesting to us all. Fancy having Saudi Arabia making a phone call to Israel. They said that they'd never do a thing like that. Well, they're all in doing it now, all of them. And the, fear, the power that they do fear is none less than Iran. So when we turn to that 38th chapter of Ezekiel, it's probably still up there. Let's go to that next one. I've just put that up because you can sort of see the patchwork uh, appearance of ISIS. That's not a country, is it? That's not a power. It doesn't make a Meccano set. It's never going to be a great power. There's no great factories there. They're hoodlums. And they make their money by stealing and they've got no central administration. But they put the wind up, all those powers around, to go one way or to go another. Well, I think it's worth just seeing that, my dear brothers and sisters, and, and getting a clear picture. It's not that power. Give them a caliphate if they want one. But that's not going to be the driving force in the Middle East. Nor is it going to be a collective of all of the Arab states to come against Israel and defeat it. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's the northern invader that does that when Israel has been put to sleep. Would you be confident if you were the head of the Red Power then? Would you be confident going down the Middle East? Changes the picture, doesn't it? You'd sort of think you've got a fairly good chance. There's a little, little slither of a country there that's didn't we learn today that France and other European countries are becoming more and more unconcerned for Israel's continued existence? France, that used to be among Israel's best three friends. The other one was Persia and the third one was the US, of course. But it's a huge coalition, isn't it? That changes your mind when you see it like that. Thanks, sir. As we said, all of those countries are on friendly terms with Israel. Sorry, with Russia. Thank you. This is an interesting one. The Middle East is there. It's fallen down. There's a representative in his Mohammedan gowns. And over here we have the American soldier. And here we have all these countries that have cooperated with the Americans. Jordan. United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar. Throw in there also uh, Jordan. 
and they're cooperating with, a, with America to the detriment of the sort of true Middle East countries. And the result? Some radicals decide they've had enough of all of this and they come out of this dead corpse and they look surprisingly like men of this system. That was a very interesting cartoon. As though to blame the West for the arising of the abyssus because the Arabs have been betrayed by the Western world. That cartoon's not altogether fiction, is it? If Mr Bush had never sent the Americans into their country and sent them into turmoil, they may well say it would have been different. Fine, though. But he saw it as a means of planting a democratic influence in the most influential area of the Arab world. So they say this is America's fault. It's the Muslims who are killing us. But this never would have happened if the West hadn't turned our lives upside down, he said. Maybe we'll be able to return one day if we have proper allies. This is coming from a group of Christian people that live in the north area of Iraq and they call themselves Assyrians and give their children Assyrian names. It's really quite amazing. And there's some millions of them, 1.5 million here. Thank you. In the, quiet, in the quest to find an effective ally, the Assyrian patriotic movement has for two years been lobbying the Kremlin for support and the group has been welcomed to Moscow to talk with officials about how the Putin administration might help. See? They're looking to Russia. This is a Christian people. And now they're going to say Russia's Christian. Russia's standing up for Christian principles. A Pope on one side and the Archbishop on the other of the Orthodox. Well, why don't we go with them? Russia proved through history that it's, it's the only defender of Christians. They assured their support for the Assyrian cause, but we're looking for a serious Russian stand in the international arena. How intriguing is that, my dear religious? That's sort of a trend of a group that were relatively unaligned until recently. But they see their future is with uh, Russia. Thank you. In believing that the king of the earth will be in that small little territory soon. And we're going to see that. We're going to witness that. We, it must be our time, mustn't it? Can't just go on. Are we ready for that? Might it be that Russia may find that Iran doesn't keep her accord with President Obama? That she breaks her promises? Might it be? And she then goes moving on, held a skill to make her atomic weapons. Would Russia want Iran to have atomic weapons? No way. No more than Israel would, really. She's a neighbour and she's irresponsible. So we can be assured there's going to be some intriguing things to see just where the Persians have pulled up. Really sketched it out very well. They're on the move. Thank you. <coughs> Saudi Arabia. I've never seen a photo like that in my life before. They are Saudi Arabian soldiers with their equipment. Saudi Arabia's on the move. She's now not just paying the cheque. She's getting her own, own people onto the battlefields. That's interesting. The record says in, in, in Ezekiel <laughs> chapter 38 that it's Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. Did you notice the order? It's Sheba and Dedan. And the order in scripture is very often quite significant. It seems from that that the sense of responsibility to rise up against the invader and to do something is not actually from the West. The West will back them from a distance. But the local countries, Sheba and Dedan, with the merchants of Tarshish. That's interesting, isn't it? It may be that they feel the pinch a lot more than somebody that's 
home driving around in perfect luxury and so forth in a far away country like they did in World War I or they did in World War II and didn't get into it until they had to. But the Saudis know that if Iran breaks the gates and bursts out, they've got big issues. So they're getting involved in it themselves now. Fascinating picture. I've never seen it before. There's their planes. Here's their uh, tanks, I suppose they are. Thank you. And I love that quotation from Elvis no, Israel. The long expected, perhaps we'll start a little bit higher, when Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things, as at present constituted, is at hand. If you had your Melchior Israel here tonight, wouldn't you underline that, my dear brothers and sisters? Wouldn't you? Let the reader know that the end of all things, as it present constituted, is at hand. The long expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel. What a lovely term. He's the solution. The King of Israel will be on the eve of becoming a fact. And salvation will be to those who not only look for it, but have trimmed their lamps by believing the gospel of the kingdom unto the obedience of faith, the obedience of faith and the perfection thereof in fruits meet for repentance. There we are, my dear brothers and sisters. Doctor wrote that for us, didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he? Did it ever apply to anyone like it applies to us? Never. We're right in the vortex of all of those things. Salvation will be to those who not only look for it, they have trimmed their lamps by believing the gospel of the kingdom. Be at Bible class next Wednesday? Are we looking at our ecclesial life soberly? Making sure that no one's getting left behind? What about those families that are really having difficulties with their children? What are we doing about it? Is our behaviour in our ecclesias sound? healthy, warm, inviting? Are we concerned above all things for our ecclesial life? Are we giving all we can to our school because it's supporting our children's faith? They're big issues, aren't they? Are we running out of steam, saying there's other things that are very interesting. Other things that I do and have to do. Other things that are really more interesting, more important, more whatever. My dear brothers and sisters, they're remarkable words, beautiful words, and they're in our literature. No one else has got those words, but we have. In Revelation chapter 22, just a word before we finish. There is a time, verse 10, to seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. That doesn't mean to say that God wants to, a person to be found unjust. It means that there will be a line drawn, a temporal line joined. There will be a moment when the game... The game's up. And our service that we might be able to give will be given. If we're living foolishly with things in our lives that others don't know and yet we know we shouldn't be and that's the temporal line then we'll live with, con con we'll live with the consequences of that. There is a time. What if it was on the way home tonight? Happy? Is our heart with God such that we, we could accept that? We've given all we can. We love his word. We, we've given all we can. I'm sure there's some people here tonight who would feel that way. And so you should. Because you have. But there's a lot of us 
but always hope there might be another bit more time, isn't it? He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, keep it up. Let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, says Jesus. You know, my dear brethren, says you can't wonder at the Bible enough, can you? Look at verse 12. This, this was written 1900 years ago for our moment of existence. And it's absolutely so apposite. It's wonderfully apposite. Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. Quickly? That was said 1900 years ago. Quickly? Who's it for then? Who's it preeminently for? For us. Because it is coming quickly for us. We're alive. And we will see it. And my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. Notice verse 12 was also saying that I'm coming to reward. I'm not coming not because I want to punish. I don't want to punish my people. I want to reward them. What a beautiful master. I'm everything. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Nothing is outside his power or his ability. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to, to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel, verse 16, to testify unto you these things in the ecclesias. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He stands for a new era where there's hope and light and, and decency and righteousness. We need to be on that side, my dear and sisters. If we've got children or friends and the truth or whatever that are sort of playing with the world, go and, go and see them tomorrow. Put your heart on your sleeve and read that passage to them. Jesus doesn't want them to be lost. Neither do we. But he wants us to do something about it. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's welcoming. It's not saying, stay away, I think you're filthy. Not really... Not really matching up. It's not saying that. Though it might be true. The spirit and the bride say, come. There's a desire to incorporate and evolve others in the spirit of rejoicing that the master is coming. And let him that heareth say, passing it on to another one, in other words. He wasn't the first to say. He heard it. But he passed it on to others. And let him that heareth say, Come! And let him that is a thirst, desperately in need, come as well in your thirst, in your desperation. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Thank you.